Uh, let, let me just go through a little bit about sort of why I, I wrote this book and kind of what some of the main points are and then uh, try not to talk for too long so that we can uh, open it up uh, for questions uh, and, and more discussion. So there are really three reasons why uh, I decided to write this book. It was actually what I wanted to write my doctoral dissertation on when I was a PhD student at Stanford, but at the time I concluded that there probably wasn't enough information available uh, from Chinese sources to be able to write um, uh, the kind of book that I wanted to write. And, and in sort of the intervening uh, 20 years, a tremendous amount of material has emerged in China on, on military affairs that, that, that helped write this book. But there are really three reasons. The first is to provide a history of military strategy in China, how it's been conceived, developed, and implemented uh, over the past 70 years. Turns out if we look at the literature within political science uh, and China studies more generally, there isn't a single book that kind of looks at the arc of, of military strategy in China and how it's changed. At different points in time, there are great overviews of the PLA, such as uh, David Chambaugh's 2002 book, but there, but there isn't a book that actually just looks at one aspect of the uh, of the PLA and sort of tries to trace it, it, its development. The second is that I really wanted to write a book that focused on how the PLA itself conceptualizes uh, military strategy, uh, which I'll talk a bit more in a minute, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute, but it's this idea of the strategic guideline or the Zhanglia Fangzhen, or sometimes referred to as the Jianxi Zhanglia Fangzhen. And then finally, the book uh, tries to also explain what are sort of the key developments in China's military strategy. Uh, since 1949, focusing in particular on strategy as it was developed in uh, 1956, 1980, and 1993, as well as some aspects of China's nuclear strategy. So taking a step back, what is military strategy? So I, I define it as how a state plans and prepares to use armed force uh, to achieve military goals that then in turn sort of support the state's political objectives. And this is important because military strategy should not be viewed as synonymous with the state's grand strategy. Right? A state's grand strategy is how it combines diplomatic, economic, military, and other tools of statecraft in order to, to achieve national security objectives. Military strategy and military tools are just one component of a state's uh, grand strategy. Uh, in China, as I just mentioned, uh, military strategy or national military strategy it is articulated through what's known as the strategic guideline or the Zhanglia Fangzhen. This is a concept that actually goes back uh, to the sort of period of the Red Army in China in the early 1930s, and in particular, uh, the encirclement and counter-encirclement campaigns in and around the, 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 the Jiangxi Soviet. Uh, so it has a very long history in the PLA. It's not something that was even sort of created uh, uh, just in 1949. It's more of like a 90-year-old concept than a 70-year-old one. And uh, each of these strategic guidelines since 1949 is meant to answer four questions. And, in the early 1990s, when devising the 1993 strategic guideline, uh, Zhang Wanyan uh, said that the strategic guideline had to answer four questions. With whom will China fight? Where will China fight? What is the character of wars China will fight? And how will China fight? And you can see if you answer these four questions, you would identify who is China's main strategic adversary, who is the operational opponent. Uh, second, what is the center of gravity where war might occur? Third, what are the, the characteristics of war that might occur? And then fourth and finally, how should China then prepare to fight these wars? Uh, so it's a, a systematic uh, concept, and it really does inform all aspects of uh, operational doctrine, force structure, and training uh, for the PLA. In terms of process, the strategic guidelines are articulated uh, usually, or in most cases, through what's known as, as an enlarged meeting of the Central Military Commission. And I'm happy to talk more about the process uh, 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 during the question and answer uh, period. So the next step here is to sort of say, okay, that I had to do in the book was, how many strategies does China have? When I started this project, I thought China only had four. Uh, it turns out after doing the research and focusing on this concept of the strategic island, I identified nine strategies. Uh, if you think about this, uh, strategy in China has been quite dynamic. Nine strategies since... Uh, 1949 is about one strategy every eight years. And that's a, a lot more sort of dynamism than I had anticipated uh, before getting into the research. Um, as a quick overview, the first five of these strategies adopted between 1956 and 1980 uh, were premised on how, uh, helping China think about how it should defeat a potential invasion. And in the 50s and the 60s, uh, uh, the most likely source of an invasion threat from China's standpoint was the United States which if you think about the hostility between China and the United States in the early Cold War makes a lot of sense. In particular, China thought that the invasion uh, would occur on the Shandong Peninsula uh, because they were, uh, or Chinese strategists were reflecting on uh, how the Korean War played out and thinking about MacArthur's uh, landing in Incheon. Uh, from the, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, sort of the main threat uh, 
come from the North in, in terms of the Soviet Union. That threat becomes most manifest in March of 1969 when there's a clash at Damansk <coughs> uh, or Jumbao Island in the Usuri River. The last four strategies adopted between 1998 and 2014 uh, focus on local war. So they're not, they're not, China from this point, from 1998 forward, is not focused on defending against an invasion from a much stronger country, but in fact uh, achieving China's national objectives uh, in disputes uh, where Chinese sovereignty uh, is contested. Uh, the most important uh, of which is Taiwan, uh, but this also includes the border with India, uh, the Spratly and the Paracel Islands in the South China Sea, uh, the Senkaku or Diayu Islands in the East China Sea, and there's actually a very small border dispute also between uh, Bhutan and uh, China, although that's not been the focus of Chinese military strategy. So these last four strategies, and really PLA uh, strategy for the last 30 years, have been focused on how to prevail, to prevail in these local conflicts. Now, of these nine strategies, three were really important, in my judgment, in terms of uh, requiring uh, the PLA to undertake really significant organizational change in order to be able to fight war in a new kind of way. And so in the book, this is what I talk about is pursuing a major change in military strategy. This is the change that's most costly, right? Because any time an organization has to reform itself, uh, it, it is just a very costly act because of all the vested interests that one has uh, in any kind of organization. Um, so the most significant changes uh, uh, that I define in terms of major changes were uh, threefold. There was the first in 1956, uh, the second uh, was in 1980, and the third was in 1993. The 1956 strategy uh, had this new vision for defending China against the invasion uh, threat that China perceived from the United States at the time. And this was done under uh, the Chinese, or carried out by the Chinese general Peng Dehuai, and there was this idea that China would conduct a forward defense that would try to basically limit uh, the ability of the United States if it did invade, or if it didn't conduct an amphibious assault from breaking through and uh, being able to uh, seize a large swaths of Chinese territory. And this contrasted quite significantly with how China fought uh, in the 30s and the 40s, which was fo focused on what uh, PLA sources refer to as mobile warfare or fighting on fluid fronts, not trying to hold positions, not trying to hold a line. But of course, defending a modern uh, or defending a sovereign nation state is very different from uh, maintaining your effective fighting power if you're the Red Army in the Civil War or, or, or later the PLA. Um, in the 1960s, this whole approach collapses. Uh, and one whole chapter is devoted to this collapse. It's the one uh, case uh, that I identified where the top party leader in China, in this case Mao Zedong, intervened in military strategy uh, to, to impose his own preferences on what the PLA should do. The other eight, as I'll talk about in a minute, were really uh, conceived of independently uh, by the PLA. Uh, and in this case, uh, the argument I present is a revisionist one, but I, I try to make the case that Mao uh, sought to change China's military strategy during this period by focusing on the idea of luring the enemy in deep uh, from the Civil War. This is the concept of Yodi Shanru, and, 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 and thereby uh, sort of adopt a very decentralized uh, approach to defending China against the United States, which would again use the mobile warfare tactics from the Civil War period. The second major change, though, occurs in 1980, uh, and this is uh, a strategy that was uh, adopted to outline how China should defend itself against the Soviet threat. By this point in time, there are roughly a million uh, Soviet uh, soldiers either in, in uh, the Russian Far East or in Mongolia that threaten China, and you know, Beijing is only about 500 kilometers uh, from the border with Mongolia, and about half that area is sort of grassy. Uh, step, air, step land, which is very uh, conducive to armored warfare, right? So Ch China felt a very serious threat. Um, and again, uh, the 1980 strategy was focused on forward defense in contrast to what sort of Mao had started per to, to uh, pursue in the mid-1960s to, again, to try to contain uh, a Soviet sort of uh, thrust into China and to, to basically protect Beijing, not let Beijing fall. Uh, Mao Zedong was very happy, actually, to let uh, cities in China be taken by opposing uh, forces, but I think m most other political military leaders uh, were not. The third uh, most important change occurs in uh, 1993, and this is uh, when China uh, uh, identifies that local wars will be the main scenario in which it will fight, but that these will be under so-called high technology conditions, and are, was a reflection of the way in with, uh, which, which uh, warfare uh, had changed uh, to focus on, um, on, on, on high technology. So a big part of the book is sort of focused on developing an explanation for why we saw a major change in 1956, 1980, and 1993 in these three strategies and not at other periods of time and not in the other 
uh, six strategies uh, that were adopted. So the argument in the book I put forward uh, sort of has two parts. Uh, the first part of the argument is to say that uh, what prompts China to change uh, strategy as sort of what I describe as a late military modernizer or as a as a major power or, or as a great power who lags behind significantly in military capabilities is what I describe as a shift uh, in the conduct of warfare in the international system as uh, practiced by other great powers. So the idea here is that uh, China looks out to the world, it sees other countries fighting, it learns lessons from how those countries fight uh, that then inform how it's going to allocate its own scarce sort of resources for defense. As a developing country, right, China can't overspend on defense because that would come at the expense of development. And this is true even uh, in the Mao period. Um, and certainly is, is, is true later on. So that's the first step. And I should say here, right, this is a sort of form of external impetus for a state to change strategy that could apply not just to China, but to other countries. It's not unique to China, although I think it has a special, has great relevance for countries like China that are in this phase of development and have to really think about how, how to allocate their scarce uh, sources for defense. That's the first step of the argument. The second step of the argument focuses on whether or not there exists uh, what I describe as party unity, or if there's agreement within kind of the top party leaders over how power and authority should be distributed, so who's going to be in charge, who's going to be in charge of what, and then what the basic policies the party should pursue are. Um, and the basic argument here is that when the party is united in China, when the top party leaders are united, they delegate a lot of responsibility for military affairs uh, to senior military officers. Uh, and they, can, they, they do so because unlike in other countries, the, the People's Liberation Army is a party army. Right? It's not a national army. It is a party army. It falls under the Central Military Commission of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Right? Doesn't actually, you know, there is a Ministry of Defense in China, but it's not like most other ministries of defense around the world, uh, which, which sort of serve to provide sort of an external uh, sense of monitoring. Uh, at the same time, China can develop, can de Chinese leaders can delegate a lot of responsibility for military affairs to the party uh, because, because the senior officers in the party are also, in the military, excuse me, are also party members, right? So there isn't a fear of a coup d'etat that you might have in other countries as well. So you have this very interesting dynamic where the PLA is often not left to its own devices, but given a substantial amount of autonomy. And with this autonomy, it can propose new changes in military strategy when uh, China's external security environment changes and, and there's a need for China to change its military strategy. So how does this play out in the sort of three cases of, of major change that I outline in the book? very quickly, because I don't want to give away all the secrets in the book, um, um, but just to give you a hint of how it plays out, right? The 1956 strategy, now, it, it is as follows, right? China learned a lot of lessons uh, from both the Second World War and from fighting the United States and Korea about what modern industrialized warfare would look like at that time. And the Chinese military at this time, people like Peng Dehuai and uh, uh, the Chinese General Su Yu, pretty intensively studied the experience of the Russians in World War II. Uh, and they believed that this was somewhat analogous to the situation they might face in the future against a stronger adversary. And they also concluded that Russia did a very poor job of defending itself because this, the country almost became overrun, right? Um, um, this, the Germans were able to penetrate deeply and rapidly in that phase of, uh, of the Second World War. Now, of course, the industrialization of warfare was very different from China's own experience in the Civil War, in which the PLA was primarily composed of light infantry units. Uh, there was no Navy or no Air Force until uh, very, very late in the Civil War or, or even afterwards. And so uh, this required the PLA to really think about uh, fighting in a whole new way. Um, in the Civil War, right, military operations were pretty intensively decentralized in different field armies and within field armies, different divisions, and uh, modern warfare would require centralized command and control. And so Peng Dehuai, in this context, proposes uh, this first military strategy, but he's able to do so because in the early to mid-1950s, especially after the Korean War, there's unprecedented unity within the party. Right? This was the period of socialist modernization, and uh, this was the period when uh, the top uh, leaders in the party were, 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 were uh, buoyed by the victory in the revolution and this desire to build a new modern China. And so you had a significant amount of union. This, of course, breaks down later, but, but that does account for the 1956 strategy. Now, the 1980 strategy uh, is a little bit of a different story. The threat in, in the, the 1980 strategy is trying to address first emerges 11 years earlier, right, in 1969. So it takes a really long time for that strategy uh, to, uh, to be changed because of the massive disunity within the top party leadership that was brought about by the Cultural Revolution. Right? The leadership was basically split into different uh, groups. Uh, they could often not agree on anything, and this completely paralyzed uh, Many, as many aspects of, of the functioning of the state and paralyzed the formulation of military strategy. 
So massive threat, really delayed response because of party unity. At the same time, it wasn't just about the Soviet threat, but how China viewed the Soviet threat in light of uh, uh, the 1973 uh, war between uh, Israel and its neighbors, which revealed uh, tremendous advances in armored warfare as well as anti-tank tank weapons and in and, and, uh, anti-aircraft weapons. So that that battle was was well known or well regarded by sort of military analysts for the speed with which uh, military operations unfolded, and that really helped China think about what a potential war might look like with the Soviet Union, which would presumably fight in, in ways that, that were uh, similar to, to the way in which Egypt and Syria uh, fought uh, during that conflict. And you have uh, the Chinese general Suyu very shortly afterwards uh, writing letters basically saying, you know, this idea we have of luring the enemy in deep is more or less national suicide because uh, the Soviets would rapidly penetrate and seize our main industrial centers and we wouldn't be able to mount an effective response. But it takes um, the end of of the Cultural Revolution, the death of Mao, and then Deng's own struggle with Hua Guofeng to rebuild party unity to the point where the PLA was then able to act on uh, to act on how it viewed the external security environment and change China's military strategy. A similar, although somewhat different story, could be told about the 1993 strategy. Uh, in this case, the big external stimulus is the Gulf War, which I think surprised uh, military analysts around the world uh, and amateur analysts like myself. So I remember distinctly going to the cafeteria in my college, in Middlebury College, uh, and watching on CNN, because then we only had TVs in the cafeteria, um, and watching footage on CNN whereby, you know, smart bombs are being dropped down chimneys. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is like... Wow. Turns out, of course, Chinese uh, military officers were watching the same videos and basically coming to the same conclusion, as are military officers from probably most countries around the world. So this had a dramatic galvanizing effect on the military leadership in China and led them to very quickly want to pursue a new military strategy that would enable them uh, to be uh, to sort of fight this kind of high technology war. So the Gulf War is, is the main external stimulus, but right, the Gulf War happens um, just after uh, Tiananmen Square. And after Tiananmen Square, of course, uh, the political leadership in China is bitterly divided, uh, and Deng has to work very hard uh, to restore uh, consensus around reform and thus to restore party unity. And so he's able to do this over a two-year period, but it really doesn't happen until the 14th Party Congress in October of 1992, which then creates the conditions uh, for, for, for the PLA to push through this change in military strategy that happens in January of 1993. Um, so... That's the argument in a nutshell, um, um, but it takes about 150 pages in the book uh, to make uh, because, you know, I want to be thorough and persuasive. Um, um, but that, that would be the summary Cliff Notes version. So China's most recent strategy uh, was adopted in July of 2014. All of China's strategies have uh, uh, slogans attached to them. So this one is winning uh, informatized local wars. Uh, for those of you who aren't steeped in sort of PLA writings, uh, informatized as a translation of Xin Shi Hua, which sort of refers to the application of information technology to war fighting, but informatized is a lot easier to say, even if it's still somewhat of a foreign concept. <laughs> and so this is the idea that um, you know, high technology will be reflected through informatized war fighting capabilities. Uh, local wars are going to be the main wars that China has to be able to fight. So it's still pretty much a focus on Taiwan, uh, first and foremost, but also uh, some of these other disputes in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And of course, winning is what every military strategy is trying to enable its armed force to do is to win. Um, intellectually, the, I make the case in the book that the 2014 strategy is uh, the second of two adjustments to the 1993 strategy. And what I mean here is uh, it's not a major change in the sense uh, that, that I define it in the book. In fact, the vision of warfare contained in the 2014 strategy is very similar uh, uh, to, to one that was in, in the first adjustment in 2004, which is really focusing on what role technology is going to play in war fighting. And that understanding is refined over roughly a 20 year period to first focus just on high technology and then focus much more on uh, information technology. And uh, the best way to think about informatized operations is something analogous to uh, the US, military, US military's concept of net-centric warfare. And this is how you can use networks to basically link uh, sensors to find targets, uh, shooters to destroy those targets, and commanders to then uh, basically direct the operation. And it more generally refers to how militaries uh, collect, process, and distribute information in order to conduct these kinds of, of operations. The case I make in the book, uh, and this is where I believe I'm on the thinnest ice empirically, because there really aren't a lot of sources available to study uh, military strategy in the current period in China. 
is that it, it would appear that the strategy was adopted primarily for, to provide an overarching rationale for the reforms uh, that Xi Jinping uh, an, announces as part of the third uh, plenum uh, uh, for uh, the PLA. Now, now, these reforms themselves are, are formally announced at the end of 2015 and in, uh, uh, start uh, are enacted from 2016 forward. But when you look at the content of the reforms, what they're really trying to do is enable the PLA to conduct the kinds of joint operations that were outlined in the earlier strategy, but that for various reasons, the PLA was unable to uh, or change itself to be able to carry out. Um, so that's the argument uh, I present about uh, the, the most recent strategy, but it's the one that I expect I might change uh, in the future as more information uh, becomes available, but it, there really isn't a lot of information uh, uh, to draw on. So what else is in the book? Um, very briefly, there, there are uh, two other chapters. Uh, one looks at uh, this really fascinating case of Mao's intervention into military strategy decision making in uh, June of uh, 1964, uh, and where he basically completely rejects the approach that Peng Dehuai adopted in the mid-50s, and that, ironically enough, Lin Biao continued until 1964. So there's fascinating stuff in here about Lin Biao for those of you who are interested in this aspect of elite Chinese politics. Um, and the argument I try to make is that by the summer of 1964, Mao is really worried about what he identified as revisionists within the party, or those people like Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, he would not sort of carry out his continuous revolution. Uh, and therefore, he, he made two very major significant changes in policy. One was economic policy, which was this idea of building a third line, or the San Xian Jian Shi. And this was a massive industrialization project in the hinterland uh, that really economically did not make a lot of sense, but politically it made sense because it allowed Mao to weaken the state planning commission and the other uh, so-called revisionists um, in the party bureaucracy in Beijing. But if he's going to pursue the third line as economic policy, he also needed a decentralized military strategy. And because he was on the cusp of, of, of launching the Cultural Revolution, it seemed to make sense to him uh, to, to sort of pursue a strategy that China had adopted in another revolutionary period in the 1930s, which was this concept of luring the enemy in deep. So in Mao's view at the time, the idea was that um, you could not be certain where the enemy would attack. Therefore, you had to present, you, you had to prepare to sort of retreat uh, deeply into China and sort of wear down the invading force through a war of attrition. And if you go back and read about the, especially the, the first few encirclement campaigns in the 1930s, which I ended up doing in the course of researching this book, you'll see exactly what Mao thought should have been done then, right? And so in some ways, he's really, he's really trying to harken back to this period when he may have been his most influential a, as a military uh, strategist. The other chapter in the book looks at China's nuclear strategy, uh, because you can't have a book on military strategy in China without looking at nuclear affairs. And uh, the argument here that I try to present is that China's nuclear strategy is really the exception that proves the rule. So I've tried to make a case in, in the book that strategic decision making in China is quite dynamic. Uh, the military in China has a lot of autonomy. That autonomy allows it to propose new changes of strategy, which are often acted upon. And you had nine strategies since 1949, three of them major changes, and so forth. You look at China's nuclear strategy as it was sort of articulated uh, with the explosion of its first atomic device in October of 1964, and basically the strategy has remained the same, uh, which is focusing on uh, achieving a sure, an assured retaliatory capability or, or basically a second strike capability uh, with regards to its nuclear forces that would allow China to deter a nuclear attack on it. It's never uh, sort of envisioned uh, uh, nuclear war fighting or kind of a, a, any sort of first use a nuclear strategy. So this is a quite a, this is a puzzle given everything I've just said, right, about how military strategy is generally dynamic. And uh, the argument I make in the book is you see this continuity in military, sorry, in nuclear strategy because it was the one area of defense policy the party didn't delegate to the PLA, right? Um, because it was so important for a variety of different reasons uh, that the party kept a very, very close hold of the highest levels on nuclear strategy. And so we see this continuity even today, although uh, China's nuclear forces have um, under, undergone significant modernization, as we have uh, saw just recently w w with the parade in Beijing and, and the introduction of uh, the DF-31 AG, the DF-41, and a, a variety of uh, other missiles. Um, so that is the book in a nutshell in um, 24 minutes. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so um, I could go on, but I won't because I'd, I'd love to have uh, your thoughts and comments and uh, try to answer any questions you might have. So thank you very much. Great. Well, one tiny, which you can answer in 30 seconds. 
did Hua Guofeng ever have any real support in the in the army? Um, there, when you say there was a struggle between Deng, I mean, you know, Deng was always. So the the struggle between Deng and Hua was not just over the PLA, but over right. every title. Um, Right, but Hua I, I didn't think of it in a struggle in the army. Well, it, it, it was not the most intense struggle, but he had Im influence in some areas. And there is one particular incident involving the Navy, I think, in 1977 that alarmed Deng uh, quite significantly. Um, what does it mean that the PLA is a party army? What difference? Should it make a difference, or is it a difference that doesn't make a difference? I think it's an enormous difference. W what of its practical implications? How should we understand that? I think the practical implication is that uh, the PLA uh, answers to uh, the guidance of the party and not to whatever the national interest might be. The head of the military commission is the president of the country. So. The head of the military commission is the general secretary of the party. Yes. Who happens and, and to also, also be, president. be the president. Of the, but the, 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 but over uh, the last years, that's who it's been. There's been a convergence of party and, and civil administration. So what's the practical difference? The practical difference has to do with uh, civil military relations. Uh, and so with most national armies, you set up an independent uh, civilian bureaucracy to monitor the armed forces. That's absent in China because it really falls to uh, the party units within the PLA to engage in that monitoring. So it's a very different uh, set of civil military relations. Uh, it, it means that uh, the party can be called upon, sorry, excuse me, the PLA can be called upon uh, to conduct operations that some national militaries might not be called upon that have to do with uh, d defending or supporting the party in a variety of ways. Um, so we see today, right, you, you have uh, both the PLA and the People's uh, Armed Police under the Central Military Commission. Uh, now the People's Armed Police has uh, basically the internal security uh, roles that had in previous times been assigned to the PLA. But the PLA and the PAP uh, coordinate quite closely in certain areas. So I, I, think it make, I think it makes a significant difference in terms of sort of defense policy making. I think it makes a difference in terms of uh, civil military relations. And I think it makes a, a difference in terms of uh, what uh, a country's armed force might be called upon to do. Uh, do most countries, well, we're kind of eroding in the United States as we appoint former military people to many other positions, but we've always had that civil military distinction, but a lot of countries don't. A lot of countries don't have civilian oversight of the military. I think countries, most countries with larger militaries have had, at least in the post-World War II period, have had civilian oversight. Um, right in Britain, it's vested in Parliament. Yep. Um, so it, you, 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 I mean, it happens to be a function of how many democracies are set up, and party armies are often uh, present in, con in, in countries with uh, socialist uh, political systems. What surprised me when I read the book was I've always felt that the Lee Dong Hui visit to the United States in 1995 mm -hmm. was a seminal event for the PLA, that it undermined the belief which had kind of taken hold during the Nixon visit and then was cemented in the establishment of diplomatic relations that we were going to stand by the three communiques and we were going to kind of do what we were supposed to do. And then when the Lee Dong Hui visit occurred, uh, the PLA basically felt their mission had changed that they needed to really focus on Taiwan. And I've traced increased military, that if you look at the Chinese, um, the PLA expenditures, after that, they really began to rock it up. That prior to them, they actually were less than, I think, GDP growth. And after that, but the book really says that occurred in 93. Am I wrong? What, what, it, it, you kind of portray it as an operation. I think you call it an operational change, but not really a fundamental change. No, I mean, I, uh, if you look at the speech that Jiang Zemin gives in January of 93, introducing the new military strategy, it's clear that Taiwan is identified there as uh, the most important uh, future scenario. And of course, what happens after January, January of 1993 affirms that judgment and more resources uh, get devoted to it. I would say the other main turning point would actually be the Kosovo War in 1999, um, because that uh, helped to uh, support a political judgment in Beijing about how, how the United States uh, might uh, respond in the future. And I think where you see the really significant... Not, not the bombing of the embassy, but just the way we conducted the everything war. Everything about it, right? The way we conducted the war, uh, outside of uh, UN authorization, uh, 
including the bombing of the embassy, but everything packaged together, right? That had a, a very significant uh, impact um, in perceptions in that way. They were probably more important than Li Donghui's visit. Because in some ways, Li Donghui's, it was a surprise that it happened, but because Taiwan had been identified earlier as sort of the main concern, it wasn't sort of... But the Jiang Zemin speech did not kick off this increase in expenditures. That it was after, if you look, I haven't, it's been many years since I've gone back and looked at PLA budgets, but my recollection was it was 96, not nine, that would have been 94, when we began to see uh, PLA expenditures, increase in PLA expenditures um, exceeding GDP growth. So there, there are a couple reasons for this. Uh, the first would be that uh, the PLA budget is often allocated through the five-year plan cycle. And the ninth five-year plan, I want to say, began in 1996. Um, it may have been 95, but when the challenge for the 93 strategy when it was adopted is it was in the middle of the eighth five-year plan. And they couldn't sort of, there was a period of a couple of years where the PLA thought about really what it was going to do and what it was going to need in terms of resources and budget. And that is reflected in um, uh, the ninth year plan. That's really where you see the PLA starting to sort of implement the strategy uh, throughout the organization because that's when uh, they're able to get access to new resources. I don't doubt, I mean, I'm not saying that Li Donghui's visit wasn't important, but I don't think it was the watershed uh, moment necessarily um, that we might conclude just looking at defense spending without sort of looking at strategy or strategic decision making. How do you think the U.S. has responded to these uh, changes in strategy? Have we adjusted our strategy accordingly, or have we kind of, we've defined it in our own way and we're not very responsive to what PLA strategy is? I think today certainly you see the United States almost seized with how to respond up to the PLA. If you look at sort of the post-Cold War period, um, you know, the U.S. armed forces have a global mission set, right? Um, and East Asia... It, is one part of that. But I think until probably the last five years, the PLA was not seen as something that would uh, be more important than the other uh, military operations that the United States was conducting. And of course, uh, as part of this, right, the United States became involved in Iraq several times, uh, as well as Afghanistan. And that really also, I think, occupied uh, a lot of the for time, effort, and sort of strategic uh, resources that was that were available to the U.S. Armed Forces, and we're now seeing this change, of course, with the National Defense Strategy uh, that was uh, uh, issued in January of 2018, as well as the National Security Strategy from December of 2017. Is it right? Is it right? Is the strategy <laughs> right? Yes. Um, is the strategy. Well, in other words, you're a scholar. Is this is this the right strategy? So I. I'm not actually sure there's a strategy in the national defense strategy, so that, that there's it's a hard prior, to be right. That there's a prior question there. It wouldn't but, pass an MIT final exam. But but I think that the U.S. has three choices, has three options in Asia with respect to China. The traditional option is primacy, uh, and maintaining primacy. Uh, that is very costly and in some ways very risky because it would certainly almost be contested uh, by China. In fact. You can view their modernization in the last, the PLA's modernization in the last 20 years is contesting primacy. Uh, uh, on the other extreme, you have what's known as offshore balancing, whereby the U.S. actually would retreat uh, it, or move its, m many of its military forces out of Asia and focus, focus instead on bolstering allies like Japan as the best way to sort of balance against China. And then you have a third option, which uh, my colleague Eric Higginbotham has uh, been developing over the last few years, known as active denial, whereby you kind of posture U.S. forces in a way that uh, you're able to deny uh, China kind of a, a quick victory, especially with regards to Taiwan or Japan or some of these other uh, conflicts that also involve uh, U.S. allies. And you don't need to engage in uh, some of the sort of arms racing or intense military uh, sort of competition that you would if you want to maintain primacy. And I'm not sure reading the national defense strategy that the U.S. has decided among these three because you see, you see elements of kind of primacy and of uh, active uh, denial. Um, I think active denial is where the U.S. will end up because uh, it is uh, – not going to cost as much and, and uh, is not uh, nearly as risky for the U.S. United States to pursue. Where do you think the real threats are? You know, you mentioned all this. Where do you think the real threats are? Now I'm going beyond your book. Where, where, where do you think, given knowing what their military strategy is, where are the real threats? East China Sea, Taiwan, South China Sea? I, I think the real threat is ta 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 the, the first real threat or the top threat would be Taiwan. 
Uh, second, you'd have the South China Sea, and then I think the East China Sea and the China-India border are much less uh, important. So all within the party's power to make sure it doesn't, parties in small p, not the Chinese Communist Party, but all within the parties to kind of be able to control. I think, the, I, I think they're eminently manageable, manageable but, yeah. but they can also be mismanaged. Uh, and and that, that's going to be the real tricky part to, to sort of challenge. All right, here's a real tough one, then I'll open the floor to, question, to questions. Um, we're spending $750 billion on defense. Um, a lot of it, if you read the strategy, even though it's somewhat mixed up, but a lot of it is, you know, talking about, um, you know, deterring, defeating, I forgot, what was, deterring and defeating China. Deterring and defeating aggression. Aggression. And, and I think they say China also. I don't think that... In speeches, that's what they... Maybe in speeches, saying, yes. But, I don't think the but, documents um, do. Um, when, when is it enough? How do you balance... In the res I'm not a military theorist, but how do you balance the defense expenditures versus the infrastructure expenditures, the education expenditures, the social program expenditures, all the other expenditures that the 750 billion make it impossible for us to fund. So how do you kind of say, when is enough? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You're the <laughs> professor from MIT. I'm yeah, just, so I'm, I'm just I'm, a poor lawyer. Yeah, but I'm going to give you like a 30 minute of on the one hand, on the other hand. So, no, I mean. You um, go to law school too? <laughs> he sounds like a lawyer. We could do the, you know, um, three I, strategies. No, I mean, um, look, there are a, a couple of things to say here, though. Uh, firstly, um, despite having just written a book on China's military strategy, I believe the more important competition between the U.S. and China is going to be economic and not military in nature, which means we need to, as a country, need to be investing more in our own technological base and our own innovation and everything else that you just mentioned. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, the more important or the more likely? No, I, I just, I, I, just I, I think it's like the more important. Um, I mean, you could think of that China and the U.S. competing diplomatically, militarily, economically. I think the economic competition is actually more important, in part because it, creates resources and technologies that can be used uh, in military affairs, but even independently because it can create a lot of wealth and influence, right? And I think we're seeing a, a very big struggle uh, over technology today, and the U.S. is probably not spending enough to meet that challenge. And defense will be one, one area. If you were looking for resources where it would come from, you could also raise taxes. I mean, there are lots of ways to get more money and, um, out of you know, the country to do these things. Um, and I think, you know, the U.S. is still a global military. And, and so that $750 billion, even though more and more of it is being focused on China, the reason why we've had such large defense budgets, even uh, since the end of the Cold War, is because of the way in which the U.S. has been globally active and, and, and engaged. And uh, it, it, it is going to require probably more choices among where to prioritize our resources. Yeah. Oh, let, me, let me get one extra question in, which is because it's, it's an important one. And, and you, you're one of the authors of a, of a letter to the president and the Congress, uh, which was published in The Washington Post, which in full disclosure, disclosure, Jan and I signed. So we, we agreed with it, which, which addresses the dangers of considering China an enemy. Um, how did the research from this book inform your views of that letter? Um, Good question. So, I mean, this book is really about what China views as its greatest threats and how it sort of plans and prepares to meet them. And I think with respect uh, to the open letter, in particular, sort of, I forget which paragraph it was, five or six, that looks at military issues, um, the main takeaway, takeaway would be that uh, because uh, China would see itself in, in a conflict or in the competition with the United States is really defending uh, its national sovereignty, whether it's what uh, China refers to as its core interests or other territorial disputes, such as the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and that there are different ways in which you could uh, compete with China in that regard, not over sovereignty per se, but over uh, defending uh, or helping uh, U.S. allies defend themselves in these disputes. And what I mentioned earlier in terms of active denial, uh, I think, is, is a, a a less risky and more effective way uh, to compete with uh, China where the United States will have to compete with China. And that sort of the pursuit of primacy and basically being able to dominate China militarily is probably uh, 
going to be very difficult for the United States to achieve and is uh, an issue in which China certainly has a vote, it has a say, right? And, and they're going to push back against that. And then you would see a really intense sort of spiral of suspicion and hostility between the two countries that could lead to an even sort of greater conflict down the road. So I don't think you can um, downplay or, or minimize the fact that you know, China's rise from a security perspective creates a lot of new challenges uh, for the United States and for countries in the region, but there are different ways to respond to that. And, at least the, the approach that was was being pursued um, uh, at the moment, which, uh, as, as I mentioned, tends to focus on uh, primacy and not other responses, is probably ultimately going to be um, uh, counterproductive. Hmm. All right, Bill. Um, Bill Longcross, a retired journalist. How important is cyber warfare, war, warfare capability in China's military strategy, and both offensively and defensively, and could it use that capability for example, to take Taiwan by knocking out of its electricity grid and its chemical plant. So my view of cyber capabilities is that they augment traditional military capabilities or, or kinetic military capabilities, the ability to you know, destroy things. Uh, but they're not a substitute for them um, for a whole a host of reasons. But it, it's very hard to, would be very hard for any country, China or the United States or somebody else, to achieve goals militarily just through cyber. Uh, and so. I, then you have to disaggregate cyber into sort of the direct military application, so how different uh, militaries will use that to try to uh, jam each other's networks and disrupt their command and control, which I think is, is an area that all militaries are focusing on today, versus using cyber, right, to attack civilian targets. Uh, because you know, all countries will have different degrees of vulnerabilities, and all countries won't even know what their vulnerabilities are, right, before, and so, um, it's basically, you know, threatening to escalate very, very rapidly, where you could potentially harm a lot of people, and that would certainly invite a response, probably of a similar magnitude. I think states in this way are often mutually deterred in, in the cyber realm, and so you see cyber, from a military perspective, at least, being more common as sort of a supplement uh, or an adjunct to uh, traditional, more traditional kinetic operations. Yeah. One quick area you didn't mention was North Korea. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a possibility if things change that we might attack them if we feel they're becoming a nuclear power. Does China have a strategy to, to, in terms of preparing for that in any way? What would they do? Is that a military uh, discussion topic? Um, so it is hard to gain access into China's thinking on North Korea for a variety of reasons in part because it's a very challenging problem for China itself to manage, and I, I don't think that, that China has necessarily come up with a, a clear set of policies that it would pursue. Um, on North Korea, though, I, I think there's certain, certainly evidence that the PLA has prepared to, to intervene under certain circumstances, uh, depending, it could be not necessarily a U.S. invasion of North Korea, but perhaps a collapse of the regime uh, and a desire to secure a lot of the nuclear material, which is actually very close to China. So much, much of the nuclear testing is not far from the Chinese border, right, which creates a lot of concern and anxiety, uh, um, quite naturally, right, because what if, what if the test goes wrong? Um, um, I don't think China necessarily is eager to fight the United States over North Korea. I don't actually think the United States is probably eager uh, to attack North Korea because when a lot of the planning is done, none of the options are very good. Um, um, and so a, a lot of it, I think, would depend on the specific scenario and how it unfolded. But in the collapse scenario, uh, for example, I have no doubt that China would intervene to secure what it believed to be its interests in, on the Korean Peninsula, to include the nuclear material, perhaps to uh, deal with uh, potential refugees, and uh, from a political pr perspective to ensure that however uh, the collapse was dealt with by the international community and by South Korea would take Chinese interests into account. Now that could be a first step towards greater kind of competition and contestation between armed forces on the peninsula, or it could create sort of a political, could create some breathing space for uh, political negotiations. But I, I certainly have little doubt in, in that situation that China would become uh, involved um, and that PLA would be the way in which China would become involved. You think we've talked to the Chinese about that? So, I, ho I hope we have. I don't, but do you think, in other words, if what I've always worried about is you have a collapse, in, which is possibly to have a collapse in North Korea, and you know, you would have this vacuum and you have these what I call loose nukes running around, which could be sold to, um, you know, some folks who don't like the United States or China very much. 
and you figure generals who are the country is collapsing, they need some gold or something to, to run away with. And so the China would go in to secure it, and the U.S. and the South Koreans would come in, but how would they not come into conflict? And the risk is that they would come into conflict, so a bad situation would get worse. Now, if you had advanced negotiations, so if you kind of said, okay, you know, China, you got better intelligence in a lot of these areas, you go secure the nukes, we'll do this, we promise we won't keep troops in North Korea, da 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 da. Do you think those are occurring? Um, I think so is not great. Well, I think the reason why I say hope so is because it, they're the kind of negotiations that China would never acknowledge are occurring. Yeah. Um, or with the United States. I, I think the United States might, but but but, but uh, they might also not want to. I mean, it would seem to be a very uh, suitable topic for various joint staff um, dialogues on crisis management, right? I mean, this would be the kinds of things that you hope they were discussing, but I, I don't, they don't. They don't reveal much information about what, in fact, they are discussing. Yeah. Albert Goldstein, uh, Overseas Press Club. In fact, that's a, it's a follow-up, actually, to your question. Um, China has not been in a major conflict since 1979, mm -hmm. and that was with Vietnam. And it was a very short but very brutal war. It only lasted one month. Despite the increases in expenditures from the PLA, enormous reorganization, et cetera, et cetera, with respect to the leadership, if there is a crisis that comes up, the, the, the thing that I'm worried about is that the leadership, whether military or political, will be paralyzed as far as making a decision is concerned or overreact compared to the U.S. who have been in a perpetual war for several <laughs> decades and pretty much know the rules of the game and how to engage. Um, what research have you come up with that the Chinese leadership is, is, is aware of those shortcomings? So they they are acutely aware of these shortcomings, and the PLA talks about them all the time. You often see it uh, described as the peace disease, um, and it's not meant to say that China then wants to fight wars so it can cure the peace disease. That, I don't want to leave that implication, but there is clearly an awareness that uh, China lacks uh, the operational experience uh, that certainly the United States Armed Forces lack, and some others. Um, I think in general this induces caution uh, because. Uh, despite all of the exercises and ways in which China is trying to enhance it, its capabilities, it doesn't really know uh, how effective they will be, even though it is working hard at exercising and training in a way that's more realistic. But I don't think any military officer wants to be the one whose forces are defeated. Uh, and sometimes that means not fighting in the first place or, or being more cautious. So I, I don't think we should conclude from the references to the peace disease that the PLA is sort of itching for an opportunity to cure the disease by fighting, but, but there is a recognition that uh, it does, uh, would certainly uh, impede their, their, their ability to conduct operations. That said, you do see ways in which the PLA is trying to exercise uh, its forces uh, more frequently and more realistically, and it's gained a lot of experience, although limited in what it means for the, the force overall from the uh, counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden. I can't remember what squadron we're on now, I think it's in the 30s, but there have been, if, from the Navy's perspective, they've actually gained a lot of operational experience in that regard. Uh, the focus on peacekeepers is another way in which China's uh, been able to gain some uh, practical military experience. It's a pretty significant contribution to I peacekeepers. You mean UN peacekeepers? UN peacekeepers, yeah. Right. UN peacekeepers. Um, so there are ways in which I think the, the PLA is trying to come, come to grips with this, but, but, it, but it, it is acknowledged that as, as a significant shortcoming that needs to be overcome. You know, Go ahead. I have more questions too. Ask you uh, what you think uh, of China's uh, grand strategy. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, they have an ambition to become the number one military power, replacing the position of the United States one day in the world? Uh, if yes, what's the evidence for that? If not, what's the evidence against okay. um, So. In the 19th Party Congress report, Xi Jinping talked about building a world-class uh, military. I think was the phrase that was used. Um, and this created a lot of uh, a debate among those who uh, study uh, the PLA in China because some people believe that it reflected an ambition to replace the United States uh, because uh, it was translated as world class. Uh, other people, and I would associate myself with this interpretation, believed it meant that China wanted to have you know, a cutting edge or a military as good as anybody else's. 
uh, without necessarily uh, replacing uh, those uh, that exist. And so I, I went in and I did some more research on this and I presented it to a congressional commission back in June. And at least what my research showed is that uh, this concept of a world-class uh, military, a world-class force is very much uh, sort of a force development concept. It's about uh, having um, the capabilities that other people have and the other world-class militaries that are often discussed in, in PLA writings would include the United States, France, Russia, uh, the UK, and sometimes even India, which I was surprised to see. Uh, and so I would take from this that China doesn't necessarily have an ambition to supplant the United States as a global military power, right? which is, would be a really big deal. I mean, the United States has got 800 installations in 40 countries around the world. Uh, this is what enables you know, the U.S. to maintain command of the commons and to, to project power and, 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 and do lots of things uh, in different parts of the world. And I don't see evidence that China uh, really wants to move uh, quickly in that direction. Um, you don't see them developing uh, forces uh, that would be uh, suitable uh, for those kinds of global operations yet. Uh, you don't see them developing the basing system you would need, uh, right? Because it's not just about having sort of world-class or leading edge military forces, but actually having uh, the ability to use them uh, globally if it was, in fact, or if the goal was, in fact, to uh, replace the United States. Instead, I think China want, is still very much focused on East Asia, where there are, from its perspective, real conflicts, including Taiwan. Uh, it is certainly focused on how it would uh, potentially fight with the United States in uh, those conflicts uh, because of uh, various U.S. commitments or obligations uh, to countries in East Asia. And that, I think, means that it's going to be, ironically enough, less globally focused uh, than it might otherwise be the case. But it is still, I think, a really significant challenge for the United States, despite not being uh, globally focused. Do they want to expel us from Asia? I think they'd be very happy if we left. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but you asked the right question. W at what price? Um, uh, and I don't see yet that China wants to, uh, I mean, again, I, I think any country would want, or any great power would want all other great powers to leave its home region, right? And that's what you sort of would aspire for as a great power. So I think if, if the United States decided to leave, China would be very happy. I don't, th I don't see China. What about, what about the argument that is often made by Chinese in the PLA that, in fact, um, our alliances keep in check some of China's historical enemies? So the fact that we are based in, that we have these troops in Japan actually make sure the Japanese don't get out of hand. The fact that we have troops in South Korea make sure that the North Koreans don't get too far out of hand and that they have benefited from the global commons, the global goods that we've provided. And they actually don't really want us to leave. You think that's just not true? I, I think that argument, you don't see it very much anymore. I think it was true in the 90s. It was probably true up to the financial crisis, and you don't see it being certainly discussed openly in that way. Read Wang Yi's speech at the National Committee's dinner. No, but you, but you can look at the 2017 paper on Asian security architecture, and it's clear that China would be very happy if the United States left, right? I mean, but I, and the real question is, you know, well, does China want to forcibly expel the United States? That's one way to get the United States leave? And you would argue no. I, say, I would say no. The costs are uh, too high. Does China want to main, you know, try to maximize its autonomy and its ability to defend its interests against the United States in Asia? I would say yes. Jan, you were in. No, and then, um, then John. I'm not sure if I would remember this because I didn't have much sleep on a plane last night. But you qualified your answer to Abu's question and you said yet. They don't want to do it yet. So. Do you think that eventually that really is their goal, but right now the costs are too great, or they don't feel they're strong enough, or do you think they really are happy, as Wang Yi and others said, to, to share power? I think if you look at, so at what price global leadership, right? It's really expensive. Yeah. Um, and I don't really see China paying a lot of, paying any real cost to lead in many areas, right? Um, not wanting to pay the cost. Not to wanting leave. to pay the yeah. cost, right? And and so, um, and and I and I think what matters to them most from a security perspective is what happens in Asia, and so that's why we're seeing the the PLA develop in the way that it's been developing, and I think why it will stay focused on Asia. Now things can change in international politics, um, and probably change in ways that we don't know. And, I mean, as a professor, I hate speculating about the future. I'm much more comfortable looking at the past and trying to figure out how it happened. And you should say, have well, gone to law school. This then, 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 then how the future, like, who, who knows, right? I mean, who, who, who expected Xi Jinping to be the leader he's become, right? If you go back to all the analyses in the summer of 2012, Xi Jinping, uh, no one sort of out, you know, made the case that Xi Jinping would be the kind of leader that uh, he's become today. And I'm not, I'm not sure even many in China 
might have made that same prediction. I don't know, but but all I mean is that, that there's a lot of contingency and you know politics to how politics develop depends on a lots of different things happening and it could happen in the future, but I, I wouldn't sort of say that's the most likely outcome. I think instead of more likely to see a China that's focused on the region, maybe that means ultimately pushing the US out of the region, uh, but nevertheless not wanting to sort of uh, uh, pay the price of global leadership. Mm -hmm. Senior military official made the argument um, that, first of all, he made the argument, which I found a little puzzling, that we've had 70 years of peace in East Asia. Okay. When I quietly said, geez, the Korean War and the war in Vietnam weren't exactly peace, but he kind of over said no. Um, and he felt that America has effectively provided in Asia over these 70 years a Pax Americana, that our Navy, our ability to maintain open seas have allowed the countries, you know, the ASEAN countries and China and Japan and South Korea to develop in such a way that, you know, we have been this incredible force for good. And I countered, I said, geez, you know, I think we've only had 40 years of peace, and I think a lot of it has been based upon the establishment of diplomatic relations and the constructive engagement that we've had with China over that time. What do you think of kind so, of that disagreement? So you want me to adjudicate this debate? Adjudicate it. <laughs> it's on our podcast. You can, you, you, you can, you can see, you can American see. American official who said it or Chinese? American official. American. It's on our podcast. It's actually, this was part of the, uh, uh, it's our podcast. Joe, is Joe here? He's not here. I think that podcast is now. It's up. It's there. Yeah. So I don't have to say it was off the record, but. So um, I think you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> what does the Chinese say? Guyo chen chiu. So no, um, certainly right. I would I would say this right within the countries that were allied with the United States from the 50s, you certainly had probably trade that might not otherwise have occurred because of the relationship the U.S. had with Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and so forth. But I, I would agree, uh, certainly in the region more generally, uh, I think the story is uh, basically how that uh, trading system that occurred within those allied countries was expanded uh, through normalization to basically include um, all countries in the region, right? Mm -hmm. um, and without that, you, I mean, I, I think that still is probably the greatest contributor uh, to, to, to uh, peace and stability was the fact that you had this open uh, system that the U.S. supported um, in a variety of ways and that China was very welcome to join it. Um, and Peter, you're dying to ask another. Well, you know, I, I hate military issues. You know, I grew up in London in the <coughs> beginning of the, in the Second World War and I don't like military. But I wonder a little bit whether the military um, is actually, we're building globally a whole bunch of Maginot lines that the military strategies of, you know, of the 21st century are basically no-win, no-win activities. That, and I loved your remark, you know, in your presentation where you talked about the, the role of winning economically is going to be much more important than winning militarily, because at the end of the day, you're left with a mess. And, you know, I'm just wondering to what extent there is actually, as we speak, a huge amount of, you know, cyber activity that's changing the game. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm British, you know, and uh, we had an empire once upon a time, <laughs> and that was built on trade. And there's a little thing called the you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and it seems to me that those things are so much, you know, more determining where the hell we're going than, you know, whether or not there's a big military in China. Unless you happen to be living in Hong Kong, where it gets, you know, you get a little nervous that there's a bunch of tanks outside. <laughs> or possibly Taiwan. I think you'd be nervous if you lived in my... I know lots of people in Taiwan who are nervous when they think about the mainland from a military perspective. Um, no, but your, but your point is a good one. I mean, um, and it gets to Steve's question earlier about Davidson, right? I mean, if you think about uh, normalization and the opening of China and how that helped integrate China into the international trading and monetary systems, it had a huge 
probably a hugely Pacific effect. I mean, think about what the world would have been like if China had not joined those organizations. Um, maybe normalization would have not happened, but spitting out the hypothetical, right, you would still have had a pretty large country armed with nuclear weapons that might have made some other choices than it has made uh, by joining uh, that yeah. system. And I think if you look out to the future, um, I, do, I do think, I mean, ultimately, e economics is always in command. I guess I'm a good Marxist in that sense, but um, uh, um, uh, although market economics, but, but I, I do think you know, what will probably matter more is, is uh, the way in which the two countries either interact economically or compete economically or some combination of both. And uh, you know, as, a, as an American, I would, I would like us to, to be as competitive as we can be. And uh, I teach at a technological institute uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, you know, every day I get this newsletter from MIT News about some fascinating you know, discovery that someone has made. Right? There's a tremendous amount that, 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 that we can do uh, as a country that we can do collaboratively with China and with other countries um, to solve a lot of you know, common challenges that we face. And so I, you know, I think there'll still be a very strong competitive element economically and that in some way built into the market system. But, but I don't think uh, um, it necessarily has to um, be one that, it, that is zero summer that would require you know, a decoupling or a separation of, of, of the two economies, which I think, frankly, both countries would uh, be worse off than they would, would otherwise be. John Lowett. Yeah, John Lewis from the National Committee. Uh, other than the speeches and other public sources, I'm curious about your Chinese sources mm -hmm. for this book, both the historic and contemporary. Yeah. And what can you tell us about that? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how much was archives and how much? So, the vast majority of the book is from print sources available in China. Actually, 99. I have almost no citations to interviews uh, because even if I learn something in an interview, I always want to confirm it in another way. Now that could create some bias or that could color the analysis in some ways because off what appears in print is not given by nature, right? That's been selected by people. Um, but so here's sort of a rundown of the sources. Um, I read, I got a, a copy of every single uh, memoir and a biography of Chinese military officers. So this would be the Hui Lu and the Zhuan. Uh, where possible, I tried to get a copy of the Nianpu. Uh, Nianpu is a fascinating document. Uh, I'm being somewhat facetious here. It is, it is a list of what Chinese leaders did on any particular day, right? So um, some of these Nianpu are really dry and boring, but others of them are absolutely fascinating because they'll actually include summaries of meetings they went to, things that were said. They'll just tell you about meetings that occurred. And so Actually, most of Chinese, China's uh, key generals uh, ha have Nianpu. Um, and these are all out in the open market. Anybody can. Yeah, these are, you know, so I would, uh, yeah, indeed, these were in, in libraries in China and bookstores in China. Um, uh, they were openly published. Um, uh, but, you know, for example, uh, then I looked at uh, diaries. So some uh, secretaries, some Mishu actually published diaries of the work that they did. So Peng Dehuai's secretary uh, published uh, a diary. Um, then I looked at uh, memoirs for anyone who sort of worked in the military system. Uh, and so there's some great, actually, memoirs from Lin Biao's secretaries that were published in Hong Kong, but nevertheless really shed a lot of light on the early 1960s. Um, then I, I would turn to uh, the Wen Xuan, the Wen Ji, and basically all the, the selected or collected works of different individuals. Now, in a few cases, right, the PLA actually on its own initiative uh, published some of the most valuable sources for the book. So. Um, I've mentioned a few times as General Suyu, uh, whom most of you probably don't know, but he was, he was um, probably the commander actually responsible for the victory in the Huai Hai campaign uh, in the Civil War, uh, became very involved in uh, sort of the general staff department in the 50s. Apparently, he didn't get along very well with other people, so at some point he gets kind of sidelined, but he gets sidelined to the Academy of Military Science, uh, where he then continues to write and think about strategy for uh, many more decades. And the Academy of Military Science, interestingly enough, published their own uh, Wenshen of Suyu, right? It's three volumes. It's huge. Um, the first two volumes are actually on the Civil War period, and the last volume is on the post-49 period. But I was able to find all these reports that he wrote uh, to Mao and to other leaders in the 1970s, which were really interesting. Um, not sensitive, just interesting. Um, uh, they also published a biography and the selected works of a different general named Song Shirlin who uh, helped uh, bring about the change of the 1980 strategy. Um, 
And I worked on this project for a long time, so I had the luxury of, of being able to collect these materials. And in fact, because I'd always been interested in, in sort of defense policy and strategy in China, a lot of the books I used in the project I actually bought when I was in grad school. Uh, but there, there is a lot of information out there, and, and these are all publicly available um, sources. Uh, and then you know, I, I used a lot of you know, PLA textbooks and other things for, for different um, periods. Uh, the PLA has a great six volume history of the People's Liberation Army uh, that goes from uh, uh, the Nanchang Uprising to 1978. And so it doesn't shed light on the Deng period very much, but it does shed a lot of light on, on, on earlier periods. And so I, I sort of quip with people that, you know, when people say China's not transparent, I sort of say, well, um, in, in Chinese, it's pretty transparent, right? I mean, like the, there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there. I mean, it's not packaged neatly for the analyst or the scholar. You have to go out and find it, and that is a real challenge. Um, and it may be harder to do this kind of research going forward than it was in the past, uh, just because I've noticed a real decline in publishing across the board in the last few years in China. You go to bookstores now, and shelves are empty. I mean, there just isn't 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 um, a lot there when compared to earlier periods. We have to end here, but that's the perfect kind of segue into the book is available outside. You can read and see all the footnotes, and the author will even autograph it for you if you get it today. But Taylor, thank you thank so you, much. Steve. This was yeah. fabulous. Thanks.